Welcome. I think we've got most people in. Like, I'm going to go ahead and start. I'm sure some people will still be coming in, but um, I want to welcome you all to our second Artists, Artists Outlook. And I also want to please remind you all to put your speakers on mute. Um, that way everyone can enjoy. There won't be other um, sounds or things. It will be all about, it's really all about Annalise and I'm kind of just on the sidelines myself. So um, thank you for doing that, everyone. I see that you're doing that. If everybody could please mute your speakers, that would be terrific. Thank you very much. Um, this is the second Artist Outlook and welcome. We are thrilled to have you here. Um, this series will go until the end of June, so we're very excited. We have an extension on that now, so we're going to have more exciting artists coming your way, which I will mention more at the end. But tonight, I want to introduce myself. I'm Patricia Tomlinson. I'm curator of exhibitions at the Appleton Museum of Art. And tonight we have a very special guest and a very talented artist. We have two of her pieces in our collection. She is a fascinating person and her story is, in addition to her fabulous art making, her story is half the fun. So I would like to introduce Annalise Dykraft. Hello. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Can we, let's make Annalise the big one, please, Gigi. Okay. Hi, I'm Annalise Dykraft. And I was born and raised in Nigeria, West Africa. I spent the first 18 years of my life there. Then I went to college in Grand Rapids, Michigan and graduated with a Bachelor of Fine Arts. And I also studied in France through the Cleveland Institute of Art um, during my junior year. After living in Michigan for a while, I needed to go where it was warm. <laughs> to what I was used to in Africa. So in 2001, I came to Jacksonville, Florida, and I have been here ever since. Um, I am a founder with other people of two art organizations, Jacksonville um, Cultural Development Corporation and Art Center. So, and um, I work mainly in printmaking, doing etch etching, um, a form of printmaking. There are several different forms, but I prefer etching. And I, I do also do other art mediums, um, acrylic and oils, but that is the, the one that I concentrate on. Marvelous. Thank you for sharing that. I think I want to start a little broad and then get more specific. So um, let's talk about influences a little bit, please, Annalise. Um, obviously, I would think at your African upbringing played a large part in your art making process and does to this day. Can you, um, can we put the first slide up and can we also um, switch to Annalise so she can tell us a little bit about that, please? Sure. So, um, like I mentioned, I grew up in Nigeria and was there for 18 years. So being in Africa is a huge influence and most of my work is people based and I, I tell stories um, is probably what I would say I do. Um, and it reflects the African culture where I grew up. It also um, reflects the uniting of cultures since I was in a class of maybe 32 uh, from first grade through high school and we had 15 to 16 different nationalities. So I'm a, I'm a firm and believer in finding the common ground amongst people. Um, so you will see um, my experiences of growing up and also my parents work. So the the rural areas of Africa are in my work, people doing agricultural work, their everyday life, um, and then a whole lot of 
symbolism that comes from Africa through um, the Adinkra symbols and Uli motifs in Sebades and their um, patterns that are in their cloth that, they're we that they wear, the scarification on their face as identity, um, their, their artwork is an everyday process, not just something you put on the wall. It decorates their um, utensils, their, their pottery, what they use every day for food. Um, yeah, so Africa is a big influence and where I grew up is a big influence of my art. That's, that's what my art reflects. That, that's wonderful. And we'll see more of your artwork in just a few moments so people can see that very direct correlation. Um, and that was what really drew me to your artwork and why we wanted you in the Appleton because um, it's just, it's wonderful. Um, and I should mention as well that Annalise al also had a show with us, I believe it was two years ago, a mm -hmm. show of all her um, woodblock prints and her lino cut prints. And it was just really great. So we were excited to have her. So if we could go to the next slide, let's talk about other influences. We've talked about your African influence, but let's talk about yeah. maybe some artists that inspire you, Annalise. So, um, so the image that we have up here is Betty LaDuke. And Betty LaDuke um, is from Oregon, but she traveled all over the world and she um, does global justice issues and depicts the human condition of people. So as you can see here, um, she did go to Nigeria in 1986, 87 and 2001. So this is um, directly from her working with people um, in the culture and her reflection of it. And a lot of my stuff is like this. Um, you can see pattern work, um, the, all the women working together, the extended family. Um, so here you're gonna see agricultural and everyday working um, food preparation from the beginning to the end. Um, you see livestock, so all of that. Um, that Betty LaDuke um, represents, I also um, have that in my artwork. Now she does paintings, um, but also on big cutout uh, boards, murals. And here we have um, one of my favorites, Paul Gauguin. And he, um, a critic of his said that his, um, I wrote it, said that his, his, his woodcuts were rough. And I like that because I like the naturalness, not so much the refined work. Um, and I tend to go that way. Um, so this is Paul Gauguin in his later years when he was in Tahiti. Um, so again, like a third world country and just the uh, primitive, the naturalness of everything um pattern work you can see that in the totem pole that he puts on the side there a lot of my work will have that and um i don't know if that's a lizard back there but we'll talk about that later in gagan's work and i put a lizard in all of my work um like um it actually reflects a symbol of me but it also symbolizes a lot of things um so those are two artists that I admire and um, have similar work to mine. And, the, and then <laughs> there's this wonderful little one. Let's talk about yeah. that. <laughs> so because I like Gauguin and I was influenced by him, I did a ode to him. And this is Les Deux Sauvages, um, Gauguin et moi, which is two savages, me and Gauguin. And um, the two ladies are his, his uh, ladies from Tahiti or Polynesian. And um, again, you can see the totem pole um, to the left if you're looking at it. 
And then um, decoration symbolisms, geometric patterns are very um, common throughout. Um, so yeah, this was one of my very early works in college. <laughs> but um, so um, having the influence of Gauguin and reflecting a piece of his work and my work together. Well, I think I didn't know that was one of your early works. It's it's gorgeous. It looks it looks far more sophisticated than someone who's in college to me. So I think that's really wonderful. And I think everyone who's watching, this is a really good precursor to get you primed for her work. She, as she mentioned, um, she loves pattern and texture, and you see a lot of that rich um, imagery in her work. So let's go on to the next slide, if we could, please. And we're going to talk about something else. We're going to talk about the process. Mm -hmm. So I, mm -hmm. I know, Annalise, people who are watching are very interested in the whole process, but everyone may not be entirely aware of exactly the steps that go into a wood or a lino cut. So if you could kind of walk us through how you make your art, I think that would be really helpful for everybody. OK. Um, well, everything starts with a drawing. Everybody should, all artists should be prolific in their drawing first and foremost to get that down. So um, a line drawing, but also with woodcut, with etching, you not only have to think of the line, but you have to think of the positive and negative space because you are going to carve away um, what what will be the negative space? So the white areas um, that you carve away will not have any color on them. So not only do you have to think of your your drawing, you also have to think of positive and negative space. Also, you have to if you do not use a um, carbon copy paper and transfer it um the other way you will have a negative of your image so you have to think about that as well because when um if you don't reverse the image to begin with it'll be reversed when you pull the print so um you start with your drawing and sometimes i will block in areas that will be the solid um color in order to help me as I go along to think of the areas that I'm cutting. And you, you have various different tools, um, cutters that have V shapes, U shapes, flat shapes. So you use all different kinds of um, tools to get your different cuts, um, small cuts, big cuts. And once you're done cutting everything away, then you row your woodcut. There in the picture you see, that's a woodcut. Um, but there's linoleum and I've also been using clay sometimes. So you row the ink on your piece of wood, on your image, and then put a piece of paper on top of it. And I start, first of all, just hand, ru hand rubbing slowly so you get the um, paper sticking to the ink. Then I use a common spoon from your kitchen. You'll see two spoons there, one a metal and one a wooden one. And you have to be careful not to use the edge because if you use an edge, you will make a marking. You want the rounded part. And then after that, there are, um, it's called a barren and it's rounded and the ones from Japan are used are with bamboo paper, um, but there's metallic ones as well. And that's a further process of rubbing to get the image on the paper. And when you do, when you make, when you think that you have a solid rubbing, um, then you pull the paper off and you see what you get. <laughs> So after that, you can go back if you don't like the image or you see something, an area that needs uh, more detail in your cutting or you want to take out an area, and that's called an artist proof. And then you go back in and um, post some more prints. Also, you see the coloring 
um, in, in here, I do a method, um, <clears throat> instead of the original Japanese method where you have multiple blocks for different colors, this is called a la poupée, and it is from the, um, wrote this down. The, the Die Brook group um, in the 20th century, um, they, they made this famous where you put all the colors and it's kind of like a model print as well, a combination of etching and model print, where you put all the colors you want on the same board. And when you pull it, um, you can never make the same print again uh, because you can't row the colors precisely the same way. So each print is an original. Um, and I keep my additions small. I don't like to pull big because I do everything by hand. So um, the additions I do are like five or 10 and that's about it. So, and additions are how many copies that you print. And there's printmaking in a nutshell. <laughs> and if people, if people are like, if I say rubber stamping, maybe you'll be more familiar with that. Or when you were in grade school, you did the potato carvings. So those are lower scales of <laughs> etching. Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating process. And it's, it's definitely, to my mind, because I'll be honest, I'm not the most patient of people. <laughs> it seems like it, you have to have a lot of patience to do this well would you say that Annalise would you agree I would say yes you have to be patient because if you go too fast you'll make you know cuts into an area or take away more than you want so yes you do have to be very patient and also you are like thinking two different ways of how you are how it's going to come out both the line and the negative and positive space. So yes, you need patience and it does take a while. Uh, in the beginning, there were many fingers with band-aids on because your tools, your tools are sharp, especially with the woodcut. Excuse me one moment. <coughs> Okay. Um, that, well, that makes sense that, yeah, you'd have to, you would be careful because obviously you've got some really sharp tools. Let's move on mm -hmm. to the next slide and um, this, we'll see her work um, again. And this is, um, this is one of the pieces that we have in our permanent collection at the Appleton that was also featured in Annalise's show when she was there. And one of the things that comes to mind when I look at this, at least mm -hmm. what appears to me to come to be going on, is I, I feel there's a real message. In, in addition to symbolism, I feel there's an actual message here. Would you, would you agree, Annalise? Um, yeah, there's always a message <laughs> besides just portraying um, the culture. There's always a message and here, um, it has to do with um, preserving nature and also just being down to basics and everything can come from nature if you take care of it. Um, there, there, okay, there, there is symbolism in here, which, so not only do you just see the image of farming but there's Christian symbols, there's Adinkra symbols in here. Um, and also the Adinkra symbols themselves are not just like one word. There's like a folktale or a parable to the symbol. Um, I have a, birds a lot and fish a lot. And, and to me, the birds and the fish are both Christian and um, worldly because the birds, to me, the birds and the fish, they can be found anywhere and they, um, it, so anywhere in the world you can see birds and fish. So that, that connects people to me and the fish and the bird also Christian symbols um, of Christ, of, of uh, carrying a message, of um, 
you know, rebirth. Um, so, <laughs> yes, um, there are several layers to what you see in this print. Uh, that makes that makes a lot of sense. I see, yeah, some really <laughs> beautiful images in there. I want to move now to talk about the little guy that is moving down the woman's right shoulder. Mm -hmm. Let's this little guy. I don't think I my pointer is showing up, but there, yeah, yeah, right there. So <laughs> about that little guy. <laughs> yeah. So um, actually, lizards are everywhere all over Nigeria, and they're quite they're bigger, um, but. Right now, I will have lizards on my um, screen in the window going after, or geckos, if you want to call them, um, after insects. Um, so, and they have been around being portrayed since the early time, the early Egyptian times. And um, they mean good luck, um, are, a protective bounty, wisdom, household tranquility. In the um, tribe where my parents worked in Niger State, the Avati people, you would see the lizard carved down their um, forehead and nose um, to reflect those uh, being a protective symbol, good luck, um, bounty, wisdom. So it's been in existence, you know, since ancient times that it's been around. And I have chosen the lizard to be like um, my signature, not the written one, but um, a visual one. So you will see that in all of my woodcuts. <laughs> yes, and we'll, he, he, we will see this little fella again. So let's move on to the next slide and talk some more about symbolism, um, Annalise. I think mm -hmm. it's really fascinating um, oh. <laughs> all of the images that you take. So let's let's talk a little bit about that. Um, so the Adinkra symbols they come from the Archon people in Ghana, and like I mentioned, they also um, not only do you like say, um, like just the first one there says knowledge, but not only does it mean knowledge, there's like a, a, a myth or a folk tale behind it. Um, and um, the one I like is the unity and diversity. And to me, they look like lizards, but they're actually crocodiles. And um, that one, is having to do with the folk tale of um, the crocodile sharing food. So, and I also just like the unity in diversity part of it, which, which to me is important that even though we have a vast majority of people in the world that you can always find some connection somehow. I agree. Why? why so, oh, sorry. And then, sorry. And then, so these symbols are in, are are put on the cl the clothes that that they wear as well. So you'll have these um, represented in what they wear daily. Okay, that's so now do some of these symbols also are they the scarification that would be signifiers of a person's um, culture mm. or identity. No, not these. The, no. Um, so scarification. You'll have simpler marks than this. They'll just be lines like um, coming out from the side of the mouth. Um, and some on the um, forehead and the cheeks. They won't, but they won't be um, like a tattoo. Okay, okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, can we move to the next slide, please? 
This is um, another piece that we own at the Appleton of Annalise's. And I really, I love the title is charming, of course, with the play on words, but I also just really liked the dynamism of this. You've got this, this young male figure front and center um, in the middle of the picture plane. And then you've got the woman sort of slightly off to whom I'm assuming is probably his mother, slightly off to the side. So I like her composition in this piece a lot. And it also makes you look back mm -hmm. to the distance um, because you can see that little hint of landscape uh, back behind the woman. You kind of want to go forward to see what's going on there. So let's talk a little bit about kind of what you were thinking when you um, created this piece, please, Annalise. Um, so I don't know if you want to show the inspiration from this piece while we're talking, but the, um, there was, there's a bunch of kids in the village, the chief's village, um, where my parents went to get permission. Here we go. <laughs> so these are kids that are familiar to me and to my parents. Um, and the one in the front is the whistleblower. And actually, to begin with, they will just take a piece of, uh, well, it's, it's grass, tall grass, and they'll just blow in between the grass and make a whistle. And then, of course, I think this one is a carved whistle. And the, in, the lady behind is to the right of the boy in the front. So I just took two of the kids from here and made um, that image from the woodcut. There you go. <laughs> so then the background is reflective of their compound or where their hut is. Their huts are formed together. And then of course you also have the maize, the corn growing. So you have their um, source of food again. And so just, just, this is just the simplicity of life, but even, in, even within that, you can find joy um, in just the little things. So, and, and make things like that work, <laughs> a piece of grass <laughs> to blow a whistle with, you know, and make, make toys out of cardboard boxes and things like that. Sometimes the simplest toys are the most fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, also in here, I like to see that the wood, the wood itself shows. So the text, so the the natural naturalism of the wood is not totally taken taken away. Um, and some of the wood pad, the grain itself of the wood uh, shows up. I like that. And there's the little lizard. You can see it right by the ear of the whistle blower. Yep. <laughs> so, yeah. You beat me to it. I was just about to say, oh, oh, the oh lizard. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, and then let's, um, I think that's it for the slides that we have just to illustrate your art and some of your influences. So if we could go back to um, the full screen. Um, one of the things that I also wanted to bring up, forgive me, I'm looking off at my list here of things that we wanted okay. to ask you. Um, yeah. Part of it too is since, you know, you, you were a student and went to school and, you know, worked hard. Do you have good what's your best advice for a student who's learning how to do art um can you give any tips or pointers for somebody who wants to be an artist sure um so my my advice is to it's important i don't think that i was taught in college to learn the business of art so that is is very important unless you're going to have someone to represent you as your marketer. Um, but also, I would say continually continue to apply to shows, no matter what, if you're accepted or not. The more you apply, people will recognize, you know, that you're trying and you're getting trying um, 
to get yourself exposure in the art world, um, build up your resume, um, use social media as much as possible, uh, have a good website and websites these days are much easier than having to code everything. Now you just, you know, use WordPress um, and you can just do your own websites these days, which is marvelous, but make sure you have a good website and um, just be professional in the representation of your artwork. Make sure that um, your frames, you know, are clean. When you frame them, there's not little pieces of hair, dirt, whatever. Um, if you're not framing something, make sure that the canvas is totally um, gallery wrapped, that you paint on the sides or you have a solid color. Um, and I would say definitely be true to yourself. Um, you you can do art to to just sell but you need to make sure that you are doing it for yourself first as an artist because um you are you are expressing you when you do when you do art that's um your your um record of um what you're portraying. So make sure that you stay true to yourself and um, continually practice, never, never stop. And I would also say, um, surround yourself with similar artists or um, other professional artists to inspire you. So. <laughs> That's wonderful advice. Yeah, I thank you for that. Um, just a little bit more, um, I wanted to ask you just a few more questions as well. I wanted to talk a little, a little bit about your creative process. I'm sorry, I have cats and they're being naughty right now. Um, so, um, okay. One of the things that has been, I, I listen to NPR and PBS and such a lot, and it's been really interesting listening to them interview various artists of all types, musicians, you know, visual artists, you name it. And uh -huh. One of the things that um, has been going on, and I know we're all sick of hearing the words COVID-19, but it, but mm -hmm. during people's sequestering, it has been very interesting to hear everyone's stories about whether it was a creative time for them, whether it was mm -hmm. not, whether they did just were more introspective, whether they produced like crazy. So could you talk a little bit about how you have been experiencing some of this, please? Uh, sure. So um, I myself did not do COVID specific art with, you know, the symbol of the COVID um, medical and also with uh, people with masks. Um, I didn't do COVID specific art. However, I did have more time to do art, especially um, when the end of March, the whole month of April, basically when we had to stay at home. So I did create um, four, four, five, five, four by six linoleum. So I did small work and they were more um, introspective and they were all on women and celebrating um, <clears throat> yourself as a woman. I did um, celebrating your crown, which is um, your hairstyles. Um, um, I did one similar to Frida and um, Annalise, Annalise, you're muted. Something just happened to your, Annalise, you're muted. Uh-oh, Annalise, can you hear me? I'm art, which I appreciate. I got five done and they were 
um, internally reflective, I would say. Okay, can you repeat the last little bit? Something went weird and you muted somehow. Could so like maybe like the last few sentences you were saying were cut out, we didn't hear them. Uh, give us a synopsis. <laughs> I'm not quite sure, but <laughs> well, I think I was. About, I think I was. Crown. Oh, I think I was just reiterating that I didn't do pandemic um, specific work, but they were reflective of of women. And then I started putting um, a childhood um, pet, the pet monkey I had, which I had never put in my artwork before. So that was something new that I did. That's cool. I bet that you had a pet monkey. Not everybody can say that. <laughs> right? <laughs> so in, in a normal scenario, do, do yeah. you create every day? Do you create every week? How does that normally, or do you wait till the spirit moves you and then just produce? Okay. Um, shamefully, <laughs> I don't create every day. Um, I do have figure drawing sessions for the art center that I hold. So I do draw the human form. Um, it was every week, now it's every other week. Um, but to do a woodcut or a painting, those are not daily. So that'll be if I have like the time or if there's an art show I'm applying to um a competition getting ready for a solo show um then i always make sure that i have at least one piece if not more uh a new piece of work so i would say i do not create every day it's more um more driven by shows and also the time that I might have. Okay. Um, your mom and dad are yeah. holding up one of your works. Can we go to Janice? Because they're that's her parents. So what are you oh. trying to, I don't know what they're trying to show. Uh, so they are showing, there's three, three framed four by sixes. They're showing the most recent um, of my work that I was talking about, the five pieces that I created. Okay, that's, they're wonderful. That's really good. We're getting a little glare, but it's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> oh, those are great. Yeah, so. Almost like a Mother Earth image on the bottom with the butterfly on her cheek and. Yep, so, oh, so that one has a chameleon in it. I also had chameleons as pets. So I am reaching back to childhood experiences as far as animal pets are concerned. And I had not done a chameleon either. Okay. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. Thank you two for sharing. I could see you holding something up. So I was like, <laughs> <"For them." laughs> okay. Well, um, Annalise, before yeah. we get to questions, yeah. is there anything else you wanted to add or say to everybody or Anything before we start asking people questions? Um, <laughs> thanks for having me. I really appreciate that. And I've had a great experience with the Appleton and I'm glad to hear that the Appleton is open again. Um, so if anyone's in Florida, it's an awesome museum to go to. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. That's very sweet. Um, Okay, so let's see if I can get, I saw somebody way, way at the beginning, a woman, I don't have it in front of me, but oh, I know it was a, I believe it was a female, and she wanted to know more about your clay printing process. She had just put that in there. Okay, um, well, I did actually do a, um, a workshop at Appleton when I showed there with clay and the clay has to be semi-hard so leather hard um and not <laughs> it can't be too wet because you'll not be able to the when you when you put ink on it it'll just go right into the clay and it'll be muddy and um can't be too dry because when you when you carve into your clay, 
it, you have to be careful it doesn't fall apart. So um, it's it's hard to get it the right the right um, drying that you need, but it's a fun process and it's a whole lot easier on your hands <laughs> as far as um, so you use so you would use clay tools and not wood wood cutting or linoleum tools. So it's much um, better that way as far as not being able to, you know, cut yourself and also easier to carve if you have um, problems with your hands. Okay. And um, you, you can't be too disappointed um, with your outcome um, because like I said, it's more of a, um, I'd say that is more of a work in, um, not work in progress, but the process of, of it is more, is more important than the outcome, I would say. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I know Lila Ivy, who has had a class with you in the past, wanted to um, ask you something, but Lila, would you mind writing it in the chat real quick? Um, that way it would be, um, we can check it out. If anybody has any questions, please write them in the chat function there, and that way we can address all your questions while we've got time. So I can, I've got a couple more on my list while people write theirs as well. Um, okay. Once again, while I look away. Um, oh, do you work in a studio away from home no. or is your studio at home or how does that work? So um, I do have a studio. It's in the it's in a garage um, in the back part of my property. However, I also do work in my house, <laughs> and I have art art everywhere, both here in my house and in the studio. <clears throat> um, I tend to pull my blocks out in the studio in the studio because it's I need to spread out. So I need lots of room when I'm when I am actually pulling the blocks with the paper racks um, for drying and everything. But I do utilize both. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Um, well, we're not, everybody's shy today. I don't see a whole bunch of questions coming in. Um, <laughs> Which don't I don't make them too hard. <laughs> I thought there were a million questions. <laughs> okay. Well, um, everyone, if you want to ask, this is the time to do it because we, you know, we're going to stop if we don't get questions. Oh, here's one. Um, this person writes, "What's the biggest size-wise that you have printed?" So I know that person. <laughs> And she has helped me with the biggest one that I've done. And it's been a door, a size of a door. So what is that? Four feet by six or eight. Um, so the size of a door. And it took, it took three of us in order to, and, and, and we used a roll of a press and it even took using a press, it took three of us in order to get it, get it right and to pull the print because it was so big. So the biggest I have done is the size of a door. That's, that's big. <laughs> that's and, and one of those actually is, um, so that print, one of them, I only made two that turned out um, great, and we did oils this time. Usually I print in water base. That one was in oils. Um, and one of those prints is in a collection at University of North Florida. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. What was the, just because I'm curious now, what was the imagery on it? Was there a specific theme? So it's, it's, um, Yes, life along the river, the two major rivers in Nigeria, Benue and Niger River, and the life that happens, the activities that take place along the river, 
And of course, there was two huge lizards as part of the river and you have the river flowing through the two huge lizards and people fishing um, along the river, things like that. That sounds gorgeous. <laughs> uh, we have another question that came in. Someone yeah. asked, do you have a particular kind of music that you work to when you're creating your art? Mm. <laughs> Um, well, I listen to world music, so music from all over the world, and I'll listen to a lot of drumming. I like, I like, um, drumming. Um, so African music, just, uh, music with no sounds. I mean, sorry, I'm not so, <laughs> no <laughs> lyrics, no words. <laughs> can't have music with no sound. Um, and I like, I like Arabic music. I grew up with a lot of Arabic people in Nigeria. And um, so French also, because I studied French. So just a variety of music. Wonderful. Susan has a question. She asked, mm -hmm. Do you put all the colors on the wood cut at the same time or one at a time before putting it on paper? Okay. Um, so hmm. I put them all on the same time. So I'll to in order to see my print first, I'll just use a solid color. Then I'll pull that to see what it looks like. Then I will think of different color schemes that I want. But if there are multiple colors, they all go on at the same time. So that's why I said it's very hard um, to get the same print because some of it will overlap. So you'll have that color combination. Um, and the, ro the rollers are big, small, medium, large. So depending on the area, um, they'll overlap. And I, because you can't, um, there's a edge to it. So the colors will overlap, but yes, I put all the colors on at the same time. Okay. And then, yeah, oops, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, sometimes I will, I will also paint after the print has dried. So I will add color if I don't think that the woodcut came out very solid or that you can see the image very well. Or if I just want to pop a different color here, sometimes I will go in and paint on top of my woodcuts as well after they've dried. Okay. Um, Marsha asks, what type of wood do you use in, in, in your woodcuts? Okay, I'm not, I'm not very specific or snooty, I would say about that. And there are all types of different woods that you can use. Um, but my wood, it could be found wood or, you know, pieces of furniture that have been taken apart. Um, but that, that is a good question because there's hardwoods and softwoods and a, you would want the hardwood more to keep the, um, the image from, not, from being a clean cut. So the hardwoods are better. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and then your mother, Janice, <laughs> is asking, do you- She's not allowed. <laughs> Do you put African faces to show joy, tolerance, or despair? Ooh. <laughs> um, I would say mostly joy for African faces. They're mostly joy. Um, because I do find them as a very happy people with the bare minimum that they have. So I would say mostly joy in the faces. And um, what was it, tolerance? Yeah, jo joy, tolerance, or despair. Yeah. 
I don't I don't like to go to the despair end at all. There are so many things to be thankful for, and you can always find something to be thankful for. So I would say they are joy. <laughs> okay, that's lovely. Um, Marsha writes, do you ever do reduction printing? Hardly ever. So that's what I was talking about with the uh, formal Japanese method. Oh, reduction not multiple plates. Yes, so reduction is, um, yes, I have done reduction. Is um, you slowly print one section at a time and then you, you will take away what you've printed and it won't print the next time. So when actually, when you've printed everything and you've slowly uh, carved away, there'll be nothing left of your original work. So there will be no, you can't duplicate it ever again. Is that, oh, wow. am I making sense? So, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's really interesting. So, so you, will, you, will have a, you will have a clean slate to begin with at the end again. You will not have a woodcut that you can store and bring out again. It, it'll be completely flat, flattened. Wow, okay. That's reduction. Okay. Um, I don't see any more questions. Anybody else have any questions? Please type them in the chat. Oh, here's another one just popped up. Marsha had another one. Um, have you ever combined several woodcuts into one? I have done that, yes. So um, I an example is There, I did babysitters, it was called babysitters, basically kids carrying children um, on their backs, on their hips. Um, I combined that woodcut with another woodcut um, that had more of a background. So the image of the kids were in front and the um, other woodcut was in the, was made the background. So I have combined um, woodcuts or prints. Okay. And then we have another one from Princess Rashid. Oops, I skipped one. I'll come back to that one. But Princess Rashid asks, <laughs> I know you travel a lot, especially pre-COVID. Do you plan to incorporate imagery from other places you have traveled in your future work? Good question. Okay. So I did a residency in Ghana um, and I did incorporate, which is very similar to Nigeria. There's only one state, Togo, separating the two of them. So um, in fact, oh, can you get it on me? Yeah. Here is one linoleum from Ghana that I did while there at residency. Sorry, and it's there in, in Ghana and has to do with fishing because they're a very, very big coastal community. And then this, it's funny, she asked, this is also while, while in Ghana, um, all the women taking the fish. And I had a solo show at the Beaches Museum and a lot of that were images from Ghana. I also did a residency with Princess <laughs> in Peru. And actually I did a clay um, print there in Peru with local clay. So that was very fun. Um, so I did do imagery from Peru, the, the mountains, the uh, leopard that's um, part of their culture. Um, the um, Aztec part of it. So yes, I have um, used imagery from the places that I have been to. Okay, cool. And Grisel mm -hmm. asks, have you ever collaborated with other artists? I have collaborated with other, other artists. Um, an artist that I have collaborated with coming to mind is Cookie Davis. And she did has done a lot of pottery and her pottery tends to look at, 
African from the uh, Gula Gucci people. And so I collaborated with Cookie to do um, a, a pottery piece with all the Indica symbols on the on the um, wrapper that the person was wearing. So I did um, a 3D. <laughs> That's really cool. I'd love to see that sometime. Now I'm, now I'm really interested. <laughs> um, we have another question. Patrick asks, have you ever done any metal etchings, copper or zinc? Uh, just learning the process while in college, that's all. So learning the different printmaking types, I, I did experience that, but to work in it myself no is there a specific reason why do you find it just really hard to to unforgiving or i mean just yeah well okay <clears throat> yeah i like being um hands-on and down to earth and that you have to use um metal plates um you have to use electricity there's burning of the of the plates you have to have um solution yeah. that's not very good for you acid that bites into the plates so so okay. there are some reasons <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair enough fair enough um and marcia writes again what did you learn on your last trip to africa <laughs> um so the last trip was to ghana for the residency and actually it had been 10 years since I had last visited um, Africa going back. So I was, I was in heaven <laughs> um, with the familiar foods and um, talking pidgin English and, and all that. Um, but what did I learn different? Um, I think I had never been to the, um, to the slave departure um, areas at all while I was in Nigeria. So that was very um, heart-wrenching and um, to experience that. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can only imagine. Okay, well, I don't see any other questions. And we are at eight, perfect right on the money at 8 p.m. <laughs> so I think, um, I, if, unless anybody has another quick one they want to type, I think we are going to, um, oops, here comes another one really fast. What did you learn? Oops, or, or sorry, any art related? Okay, hold on, let me back up. Oh, okay. The question she already asked to say, when you were last in Africa, did you yeah. learn any art related skill? So yes, we did um, we did batiking with the wax and um, printing with the um, calabash adinkra symbols. So that was very fun using the wax process to um, create on cloth images. That that was very that was fun to learn. Cool. Cool. Yeah. All right, well, I think we are going to wrap this up and thank our wonderful artist again, Annalise. It has been just a pleasure. Mm -hmm. And before we go, um, I did want to mention as well that the next um, Artist's Outlook, I'm just gonna make sure I get the date right, will be mm -hmm. on November 19th, and that will be with artist Clayton Pond. Clayton Pond, is a fascinating person. He was instrumental in the Chelsea art scene in New York. He does very vibrant, bright seriographs, which, um, and a lot of critics at the time tended to lump him in with the pop art or the op art movement, although he himself sort of eschews labels. He doesn't really want to do that, but it's very vibrant, very fun, very cool. So um, we're looking forward to that as well. And we all, once again, want to return to Annalise and say thank you so much. It has been a pleasure. Yeah. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it.
Okay, good night, everyone. Thank you all so much for attending. We appreciate your support and we'll see you next time. Good night. Mm -hmm. Bye.